Welcome to the podcast, Medicine Untold, and come with me on a journey to the unexplored side of medicine, where we speak with rebel doctors, radical herbalists, unorthodox healers, and patients who have healed themselves. Explore the intersection between science and spirituality, and discover the power within you. I'm your host, Dr. Michelle Berglund, licensed naturopathic doctor, botanical alchemist, and practicing physician. Hi, everyone. I'm Dr. Michelle Berglund, and this is Untold Medicine. And today we have a guest, Stephen Knapp. And Stephen Knapp has written books on Vedic culture, Eastern philosophy, and spirituality. Stephen has studied the major Vedic texts of India and practiced yoga in Ethiopia. Eastern teachings for over 40 years. He's traveled extensively throughout India and has authored over 50 well-received books on Vedic culture and spiritual philosophy. And today he continues to write books, articles, and give lectures at various venues. So welcome, Stephen. I'm excited to have you today. Namaste. Thank you for being, <laughs> uh, inviting me. <laughs> so to kind of get started, I wanted you to Tell me a little bit about your background and how you went into studying Vedic culture and how you went so deeply into it. So tell us a little bit about your story of how you found it. Well, I guess you could say it all started when I was about seven years old. And because I distinctly remember one time, of course, there was uh, many times, but I was laying in my bed as a child, seven years old, wondering, how did I get here? How did I get here? Not just here in this world, but how did I get this particular body? Why didn't I get my neighbor's body, Jack's body, or Dean's body? But if I got in the, into that body, that means I would have their his their his parents. If I had his parents, maybe maybe I'm, I'm in a better position right now. Maybe my parents aren't so bad, you know. And uh, but that was the kind of, you know, talk about how weird I was as a kid. Those were the kind of questions I was asking. How did I get here in this body? Why didn't I get into somebody else's body? Because I already already had a feeling and a perception that I was more than this body. I was simply a person, a spirit soul uh, that got injected, you might say, into this particular body. But now that I'm in this body, why do we have to feed it? Why is it so vulnerable? You don't breathe for 10 seconds and you, you know, you almost die or something. Or, or you feed it and then you've got to take it to the bathroom and you've got to make sure it gets so much rest and uh, all this other stuff. You know, it's like, uh, it just didn't seem natural to me. I mean, I don't know where I came from before this level of existence, but this level of existence in this particular body was not suitable for me. It wasn't comfortable. I've never been comfortable in this particular body. I've never been comfortable in this particular world for that matter. I mean, you get used to it after a while, but the question still remains, how did I get here? Where did I come from? Where am I going? And where should I be going? In other words, is there a purpose behind all this? So these were the kind of questions I had. And of course, you know, being raised a Christian, sometimes you'd ask people these questions and they didn't have the answer, or they would say, don't worry, you know, if God meant for us to know, he would supply the answers. Well, I want the answers. I want to know, you know, so, uh, and so anyway, you get involved in so many different things in school and stuff as you're growing up. But then, uh, then I was a musician in my late teenage years. And uh, some of us would get together, you know, some of us more avant-garde uh, musicians would get together and wonder, okay, where do we fit into this world? And that kick off that original questioning that I had was that uh, maybe it's time I should put my guitar down for a little bit and actually try to investigate what am I doing here? What am I supposed to be doing here? What's the purpose of all this to begin with? And uh, so that's what I did. I put my guitar down for a little while and I just started looking around. And I guess you could say I conducted my own comparative religion class where I studied everything, everything I could get my hands on. You know, I, of course, born and raised a Christian, I figured, well, might as well start with the Bible. So I studied the Bible from cover to cover, read the whole thing. <clears throat> it took me a whole year to do that, because it's not always the easiest reading. But, uh, and I could see where it's got a lot of wisdom, it's got a lot of, got a lot of moralistic principles that it teaches, that it presents. 
uh, but it still didn't give me the answers as to who am I as a spiritual being and how to recognize the existence of God in all, you know, creatures and uh, things like that. So uh, I started looking around. I checked out uh, Judaism, Egyptology, uh, magic, Tarot, I Ching, uh, Eastern mysticism, uh, Buddhism, uh, practically everything. And uh, and then gradually, I had a friend of mine that was also into this uh, kind of thing. We'd have these conversations about uh, the topic that we're speaking about now. And he went to Toronto. We are originally from Michigan in a small town of uh, Buchanan in the south uh, western corner of the state. So he went to Toronto and met some Hare Krishna devotees on the streets. And they gave him a little pamphlet of the books they had. Back then, they only had about six books. You know, they got a whole bunch of books now. But um, so we were, he brought that back and we were going over this pamphlet and he was saying, yeah, there's this book and, uh, yeah, I'm interested in this one. This is easy journey to other planets and this one here. Uh, I said, what's this one? This, he said, this is like the Hindu Bible and it was the Bhagavad Gita. So I said, that's what I want because that's what I was looking for. That's what I was studying. What are the different cultural presentations on who and what is God? Who are we? Are, what is our spiritual identity? Uh, you know, and so forth. How do we got here? Where we should be going? And so I said, that's what I want. So I got this uh, sent for the Bhagavad Gita, which was a little blue edition at the time, uh, an abridged edition of what they came out with later, and by uh, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada. And so once I got that, I looked into it and I started reading it and uh, told me all about what is karma, what is the soul, what is uh, reincarnation, who or what is God, how we got here, where we're going, where we should be going, I answered all the questions, the essential questions I had. Because the interesting thing, too, is in the Upanishads, there's a verse that says, until you begin to ask these questions, you're not even a human being. Because that is the purpose of life, is to ask these questions. And no questions, that's one of the things that I really was attracted to about the Vedic culture is that no question is out of bounds, you know, because in some religions, if you ask too many questions, you know, you're considered a downing Thomas or you lack faith or something like that. Mm -hmm. But in the Vedic tradition, it's all based on questions and answers. So, and practically speaking, if you have a question, it's practically already been answered somewhere. You just have to find out where it is. So whether you take the Upanishads, the Vedanta Sutras, the Itihasas, like the Ramayan, the Mahabharata, and Bhagavad Gita. Bhagavad Gita is just one chapter of the Mahabharata. Or even further into the Puranas, it's all based on questions and then answers. And you can ask practically any question you want. And through that process, you begin to find out what is the purpose of life, who or what you are, and, and how, and not only that, but it's not just answers but it's also the process of yoga that they give you, which gives you the means by which you can spiritualize your consciousness so that you actually perceive what the answers mean and perceive your own identity as a spiritual being, which is more important than just having the philosophy. But it's when knowledge becomes realized knowledge or jnana becomes vijnana, as they say in Sanskrit. And this is the difference. So once I got this Bhagavad Gita, then I all, all I knew is I want more of this. Whatever it is, I want more of it because these are the answers I'm looking for. So then I got into the Upanishads and Manu Samhita and whatever I could get my hands on. And uh, it, it was like the one last piece of the puzzle that I was putting together because I could see all this knowledge from all the, studying all the different cultures. It's all connected. It's all related. It all presents various aspects of the what is the spiritual truth. But this was like the final piece of the puzzle, which put it all together. So this is what I really wanted and continued to pursue. And then gradually, I decided, you know, uh, maybe it's time I should uh, give up music and take this spiritual process a little more seriously. So it was, uh, when was it? So then I started going to temples in back in 1972. And uh, decided to learn temple etiquette and uh, 
rituals and seeing them at least and uh, getting used to it, um, especially the vegetarianism, which I adopted at that time as well. I had three things that happened. I had a book called the Sri Isha Upanishad, which explained that one should not, uh, you know, uh, kill animals just to satisfy the taste of the tongue. And then I had a vegetarian friend who said, yeah, it's not so difficult to be a vegetarian. And, and then the other thing was, I never liked eating meat anyway. I didn't care for it. I didn't like the cruelty that was behind it. So all of these three things came together. And I decided, okay, I'm going to be a vegetarian. And I remember, you know, I was just starting to move out of the house, you know, I'd already lived out of the house for a while, but I started to move out of the house. And my mother was saying, oh, you're going to be vegetarian. So now what am I supposed to make for you? <laughs> I said, anything that, without meat, that's all. It's not so difficult. But then uh, shortly after that, I moved out and practically uh, never lived at uh, home again, except for very short periods of time. And uh, And so then when I started going to the temple, they had these massive vegetarian feasts. Whoa, that was a whole nother trip. You know, it was like all this delicious food that was Indian based, Indian based recipes, but without meat or any cruelty in it or anything like that. And uh, boy, that, that opened up a whole nother door of, uh, you know, spirituality for me. And then uh, so then gradually uh, I was still attached to music, but gradually giving it up. And so then I finally joined the ashram in 1975. And uh, then I started getting serious about studying the process of, uh, you know, developing a spiritual connection between myself and God and all other beings. And uh, so this, uh, I went on with this for about 10 years until uh, 1986. Six, I think it was, 1985 or 86, when I decided, you know, I want to try to explain this process and this knowledge to others, mostly Westerners. I was mostly interested in uh, explaining this to other Westerners, because as many Westerners are, when they see something that they feel is great, they want to share it with others. And uh, so that was very typical of me. And uh, so I came out with my first book at the time, which was The Secret Teachings of the Vedas. And what I did was I tried to make a point, okay, this is the way that it's presented, this idea is presented in the Vedic literature in such a way. Then I would come up with the uh, uh, references. So in that way, I tried to let the Vedic literature speak as much for itself as possible. That I'm just, I, because a lot of New Age books, they come out with all this theory, all these, you know, great revelations but where is it coming from? They don't give any references mm -hmm. to where it's coming from or anything. So I wanted to do the exact opposite with that. I wanted to show that this is where it's coming from. And basically, you could see that the roots of many of the New Age philosophies and ideas were basically established well within the Vedic doctrine. And uh, so that's pretty much how I stuck with that uh, process presenting an idea, an explanation, and then the references where in the Vedic literature this is explained, you know, even more thoroughly than what I was presenting. And uh, and it developed into a bit of a cottage industry. I remember one time, this was back in the early 90s, when I got a phone call. Phone call from somebody saying, do you have the Vedic, uh, the secret teachings of the Vedas uh, uh, for sale, I says yes, I do. Uh, what's the wholesale price? Well, it's uh, six seventy two or whatever it was back then. Okay, can you send that to us? Yeah, okay. What's your company name and address? We're Amazon. I'm going like Amazon. What the hell is Amazon? You know. So, <laughs> but yeah, sure, I can send it to you. And so they, you know, they would order one copy, then they would order another copy, then another copy, and I'm going like, wow, this is starting to change things. And um, so it just kind of developed where I wrote one book, another book, another book. And, uh, you know, the Vedic Prophecies was another book that came out uh, later on. And then uh, what was it? How the Universe Was Created, basically the Vedic version of the creation of the universe, how everything comes together, 
how the spiritual energy is condensed in a way which becomes material energy, that kind of thing. And um, and then basically I came out with another book called Proof of Vedic Culture's Global Existence, where I came out with a book that explained the evidence that you can see in other cultures from all over the world where its influence from the Vedic tradition can be recognized with the proper understanding, the proper knowledge. And I didn't think anybody would be that interested in that book. And I have to admit, it's been one of the dumbest decisions I ever made to think like that, because it became one of my most popular books, uh, especially amongst other Indians and even academics, whether they agree with it all or not. But to pro pro uh, propose the ideas that um, in this tradition or in that tradition, you can see that this is coming from the Vedic literature, the Vedic tradition, and presented in this way, in this particular uh, text, whether it was from South America, uh, Cambodia, uh, you know, even Africa, some of the African traditions are very similar. Because so you could once again see on a whole different level the connections from the Vedic, from the various cultures from around the world, and how they're all intertwined, and they have a basic root or similarity that can be connected with the Vedic tradition itself. So once that book came out, it did become one of my better selling books, which was much to my surprise. And uh, it also opened the doors for me to become uh, more accepted in India, where I was getting invitations, invitations to accept uh, a speaking engagement in a conference, or even once I got there, they would different uh, organizations would set up uh, lecture tours for a month, maybe at a time. I remember one lecture tour I did, <laughs> and it was one of my more recent ones when I was starting to get a little older, you know, and people were wondering if I could do it. But it was I for a month I did uh, something like. 92 lectures at 70 different organizations all within 30 days. And even wow. then, some of the people were saying, yeah, we weren't sure if you could handle it, you know, at your age. But, I think uh, anybody I, handling that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was about, uh, I counted, it was about three lectures every day, plus oftentimes an evening program at somebody's house. And... Uh, uh, that and I had uh, usually maybe one day off a week, um, but yeah, I made it. I made it through, and uh, it was uh, an amazing experience. I met a lot of people, a lot of people, uh, and impressed a lot of people. And I was also impressed with them. And uh, so that, uh, but anyway, that was part of a series of events that opened up only because of that one book, Proof of Vedic Culture's Global Existence. And then I came out with other books after that. Now I've got over 50 books that are available. And uh, and they're still selling. And uh, even though I've slowed down quite a bit, I have to admit that. I'll, I'll be quite frank about it. I don't do as much writing and I don't do as much uh, traveling. I mean, I have to admit, I, I don't care for airplanes anymore. <laughs> I don't care for airports anymore. Yeah. And uh, you know, it's one of those things I can do without. And I reach a stage of life where, you know, if it's not fun anymore, should I really do it? Mm -hmm. So uh, I've slowed down quite a bit in that regard, but still uh, I do, you know, some podcasts like this once in a while, and uh, I'm still very active in other ways. And uh, people still write to me about my books and ask questions and things like that. So that's pretty much how it got started. And then uh, of course, the other part of it is uh, once I was in the ashram back in 75, I got, initiated by A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada in 1976 and uh, got a spiritual name called Sri Nandanandana, and, uh, which can be a tongue twister for some people, but basically what it means is it's a very conf confidential name of Lord Krishna. It means Sri, or the beautiful, Nanda, which means uh, Nanda Maharaj, which is Krishna's father, and Nandana means the son of, or 
the son of Maharaj Nanda, the beautiful son of Maharaj Nanda. And of course, at the end of that, we always say das, which means servant. So I'm the servant of that particular person, which is another name of Lord Krishna. And uh, then I became very involved in the process of bhakti yoga and uh, studied that very carefully, came out with a few books on that. Those books are doing well, too, surprisingly, because I wrote those books primarily for people that are interested in bhakti yoga itself. And uh, I don't know who's buying them, but, you know, some people are, you know, some of my better books are those particular books on bhakti yoga. Uh, and so now I've kind of gone through the basics, you know, studied Bhagavad Gita very carefully, studied the Puranas very carefully. And now I'm entering into a new phase of bhakti yoga, which is called Raganuga Bhakti, which is a different level of bhakti yoga itself. Not everybody's ready for that, but um, it's what I'm very much uh, happy with right now and studying that very carefully. And uh, so that's that's pretty much how I've all evolved in this process. And uh and once in a while, I'll still do a lecture here and there, maybe at one of the local temples and stuff. Uh, and I'm pretty satisfied with doing it. I've reached a point of inner contentment where I'm happy with the work I've done. I was also the president of what an uh, organization called the Vedic Friends Association for 15 years. And uh, that was able to also break down some barriers in uh, acceptability, especially to Western uh, people that are interested in Vedic culture. And, uh, but I've given that, the presidency over to somebody else now and let them do it. And so I can take more of a background role in that and considered one of the elders. So <laughs> that's uh, interesting. And uh, so, yeah, I've uh, pretty much come to this point now and I'm pretty happy with what I've done and what I've accomplished how many books I've gotten out. And I can have, honestly say that I'm glad I wrote many of the books when I did because my consciousness is on a, is on a different level now. And I probably would not be that interested in writing many of the books I used to. For example, you know, a Proof of Vedic Culture's Global Existence is one book that I'm very proud of. I'm glad I did it when I did. And I came out with another book similar to that, with additional information called Mysteries of the Ancient Vedic Empire, which took it up to a whole nother level, which is more, I guess you could say, more academically oriented with a lot of footnotes, a lot of references, stuff like that. But at this point in time, I'm hardly even interested in that topic anymore. So uh, I'm glad I did it when I did. And now it's onward and upward to other things and other aspects of the uh, spiritual tradition of Vedic culture and bhakti yoga. So that's pretty much in a nutshell, you know, what my background is and my development. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, I mean, that's, it's quite a journey. And I think all of your books have power and that energy will always be there and people, everybody will find them who needs them at the right time too. And so you put that out there and uh, and I hope like with this podcast too, introducing more people to these books and and how I found you and how it spoke to me and I just found your book and I'm like oh my god this is amazing and it and it really speaks to me on a level I can understand but it gives all these great references and I can dig and go deeper like if I want to based on that and and yeah there's a lot of amazing energy there where uh, you built the foundation and and the people have the opportunity to find them too. So yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. And that's exactly what I tried to do is present the information in a way where, you know, you can go deeper. For example, I've got uh, one book here called, uh, well, two books called the, uh, the power of Bhagavad Gita, which uh, for those people that want to look into Bhagavad Gita, this is a book that kind of gives an overview of it and what you can get out of it. And uh, so if a person wants to think about getting into reading Bhagavad Gita, and I, I suggest Bhagavad Gita for everybody, uh, you can also read this and get something more out of it. And uh, then there's another one called, uh, these are smaller books, because uh, 
like even the one you got, I think you told me you had uh, the soul, our understanding of our real identity. Yeah, got it here. Yep. <laughs> got it there. Okay. It's something I wanted to present in a simplified way and in a short book so that people don't feel un encumbered with, you know, like three, 400 pages of something, even though I got plenty of those books too. You know, I wanted to write something that was short and to the point. And this other book here is uh, uh, The Power of the Maha Mantra called What's So Special About Chanting Hare Krishna, which is also a very uh, powerful mantra in this day and age and recommended as an easy process for spiritual upliftment. And that's the thing about this age of, well, it's called Kali Yuga, because people don't have the time, they barely have the interest in delving deeply into genuine spiritual uh, knowledge and, and developing the process for developing their own spiritual realizations. So you want to give them something in a way that uh, they can accept easily, quickly, and without uh, difficulty in understanding. And that's one thing I don't do is I don't use a lot of Sanskrit in my books. There are some books you can get and they use a lot of Sanskrit and everything, but I found that for some Westerners, especially, if you use too much Sanskrit, they get confused about the meaning of it or what it, what the purport of the uh, uh, topic is when it, there's too much Sanskrit words you being used. And then they'll put the book down. And the point of it is, you don't know if they're going to pick the book back up again. Uh, so I try to keep it simplified in a way, and I don't use you know, too much Sanskrit or anything like that so that people can simply keep reading it and get as much out of it as they can without being encumbered by phrases, language, or even words that are is going to, you know, make them stumble or get confused about anything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I think it's great you would apply a lot of like real world examples inside your book too, or to have it kind of think in a different way and then mm -hmm. And then cite different sources. I feel like that helps me too. And then, yeah, giving people the opportunity if they want to go deeper than they can, but they get the knowledge and they get the feeling and the essence from this, which you've done a good job with. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> hey, I, I have some intense questions for you, but that's also about this podcast and, and going deeper. Alrighty. That's the purpose. So <laughs> the next one is based on your wisdom that you've acquired throughout your journey how do you view the purpose of life and the reason for suffering? Okay, that's a two-part question. <laughs> the first purpose is, uh, the first part of the question is the purpose of life. Uh, and I can pretty much summarize that up in the Vedic culture being the culture of Sanatana Dharma. Sanskrit, Sanatana means that which is eternal. Now, eternally means what we do eternally, but also means our identity as what is eternal. What is our, our eternal identity? Dharma means, there's multiple meanings of dharma. Dharma also means duty. Duty to pursue in this life. What is our eternal duty? Sanatana dharma. Our eternal duty is basically to find out who and what we really are as spiritual beings. Dharma, the root word of dharma, is also dri. Dri also means balance. To reach a stage of life where we understand who and what we are and can become balanced in that identity and how we act in this material world for the benefit of ourselves, but also for the benefit of others. And so that we can attain that knowledge which lets us, un lets us understand what is our connection with the Supreme Being. We're spirit soul, or Atma, as it's called, and all yoga is meant to connect us with the Paramatma. Paramatma means the super soul, soul, super soul, Atma, and Paramatma. And so the connection is part of the duty of life, part of the Sanatana Dharma, is to establish that connection and understand who and what is God, what is our connection, and how we not only understand that, but how then we act on that level. It's one thing to have the answers, but it's another thing to realize the answers and then act on that level so that we attain the proper balance, the proper 
attitude towards others, and so on. Now, suffering, what is the purpose of suffering? Well, unfortunately, there's three types of sufferings that are explained in the Veda, Vedic literature. And that is the Adi Baudic, Adi Daivic, and Adi Atmic. Adi Atmic means the suffering which comes from simply having a body. You can't ignore it. That suffering can be toothaches, headaches, uh, aches and pains in the body, or more serious diseases, which happens. It happens because the body, anything material breaks down. It goes through six phases. First of all, birth or creation, growth, sustenance, deterioration, disease or deteriora deterioration in, in the sense it begins to fade away or break down, and then finally death. Anything material goes through the, those fix, six changes, including the material body. And part of that phase is disease. You get disease. The other part of the uh, suffering goes from Adi Divic, which are natural disasters. Uh, we've had lately a severe winter in crossing over mm -hmm. America. That's something nature gives. You can't expect a smooth ride all the time. We want a smooth ride, no doubt about it. And we're always hoping for a smooth ride. But then nature comes along and just, you know, crushes our hopes in that regard sometimes, whether it's through vicious winters, hot summers, uh, drought, uh, other floods. You know, we're having all this rain come across now. It's like we're getting hammered by Mother Nature these days. So it's let to, it's basically the purpose of that is to let you know this is not your real home. It never is your real home. It never was, it never will be your real home. We have to deal with it as best we can, but the idea is to search out where we really belong. And in that regard, we're like fish out of water. We're spiritual beings in the material world. Do we belong in this material world? No. How long does it take before we understand that? Well, a lot of suffering sometimes, or sometimes you're born with that inquisitiveness like that. The other third uh, thing that I was mentioning is Audi uh, Baudic. The Audi Baudic suffering is sufferings caused by other living entities, whether it's other people, whether it's criminals, whether it's your neighbor's barking dog, whether it's biting insects or things like that. These are the three types of sufferings that never go away. And so sometimes people resort to whatever means necessary to uh, decrease their suffering, whether it's intoxication, uh, whether it's uh, maybe getting involved in sports or whatever it is to get their mind off the suffering. So in many ways, and I don't mean to be a bring down about this, but the Vedic literature also explains that many times uh, the freedom from suffering is simply the forgetfulness, the temporary forgetfulness of the constant bombardment of suffering that we have to endure. Of course, the more spiritual you become, the more you're fixed in the reality of who and what you really are. And I've often said that suffering only exists within the illusion, only the illusion that you're this body and the whole goal of life is to make satisfy and make happy the mind and the senses, which is an uphill battle, quite honestly. So you have to look at yourself from a spiritual point of view from the realistic or the reality point of view, so that you can begin to understand who and what you really are and how to actually attain real happiness, real happiness from within, not based on the externals around you, which are constantly changing and constantly giving you sources of frustration and, and uh, problems. So the more inward you go, the more spiritually you go, the more free you become from all that. So, it's like a fish being out of water. You know, you can't do anything for a fish, but bring it back to the water. Then it's going to be happy to some degree. And it's the same thing with us. We can be happy to some degree in this material world, but we'll never be fully satisfied, fully happy until we reach once again our spiritual identity and regain access to the spiritual dimension, which is the whole purpose of yoga. So, Suffering has 
the it's supposed to give you the impetus to understand and question your existence. Why am I suffering? Why am I going through this? Why is life so difficult? It's another way of asking, wait a minute, who am I? What am I doing? And how did I get here? It all goes back to that. Mm -hmm. So this is really the purpose of suffering. But once again, to overcome suffering, you know, we have to do more than simply resort to the forgetfulness of it or the uh, intoxication, which is called uh, the river, visiting the river of forgetfulness. You have to do more than that. You have to go inward and actually understand your spiritual identity and go into the uh, world of reality, spiritual reality, to actually understand who and what you are, why am I here, who or what uh, brought me here, and how, how do I get out, really? How do I develop myself in a spiritual way where I can return to the spiritual world and uh, take up real residence where things go on in a continually loving basis? That's one thing we're all looking for. That's the nature of the spirit soul. We all want to love. We all want to love and be loved. But we can find maybe a glimpse of that in the material world. But even then, it's very difficult. It's, find a hard, it's hard to find someone who truly loves you. It's hard to find someone that you can truly love. And the problem with that, too, is that sometimes it ends prematurely. The person dies or I die, or then, you know, we're forced to look for another situation or whatever. I mean, is that fair or not? Well, it can seem like it's unfair, but it goes back to the two things. Suffering is meant to give you a lesson as to why you should look as for your real home. It also gives you the impetus to ask, how did I get here and why am I going through this? And if I'm going through this, how do I get out? That was Buddha's question too. He saw there's so much suffering in the world. He decided, wait a minute, how do I get out of this? How did I get here, but how do I get out? So this was one of the things that, you know, is the basis of any very philosophical religion or culture is to begin to understand how did I get here? Where am I going? Where should I be going? And how do I accomplish that? So this is the next step. If you can uh, understand the purpose of suffering, then you can also begin to understand there's a purpose that don't think God created this creation without a means of getting out of here. You know, that would be completely unfair. But the point of Sanatana Dharma, the point of yoga, is to regain and create a or spiritualize your consciousness so that you can begin to perceive the spiritual dimension which exists all around you. It's like a radio. There's so many radio waves all around us. Do we see them? No. Do we taste them? No. Can we feel them? No. You have to have the right receiver. And then with the right receiver, a radio or cell phone these days, there's so many things you can do with those radio waves. So it's not a question of whether they exist or not. It's a question of how you utilize them and how you can gain access to them. The spiritual dimension is the same way. It's a matter of how you develop yourself into being a receiver of understanding and perceiving all that spiritual dimension, all the different levels of spirituality that exist all around us all the time. And it's just, and we're a part of that. But we need to develop ourselves so we can dive back into that dimension. And then we don't take suffering, we don't take disease, we don't take all the problems of life in the same way as we did before, because we rise up to another dimension. And as we rise up to that spiritual dimension, everything looks different and makes all the difference in the world just by rising up to that level. And that's really part of the purpose of human existence. The animals can't do that so well. You know, they're pretty satisfied with just getting enough to eat or things like that. Human nature is that, yeah, sure, we got to have enough to eat, but there's more to life than that. We need to understand how to accomplish that. And that's what the Vedic literature is all about. It explains it from so many different levels. Anybody can plug into it on any level they want and, uh, and proceed from there. You know, so whatever your background is, it's perfectly all right. It doesn't matter. You can use whatever background you have and begin to plug into the Vedic culture in whatever way is most suitable for you 
to begin your progress in understanding your spiritual dimension and how the spiritual dimension exists all around us. It's only a matter of spiritualizing our consciousness so we can perceive it and enter into that level of reality. Yeah, my, extremely well said. <laughs> I think you touched on every point and truly explained that in a way that I understood too. I mean, just the real purpose of suffering and and how it can in a way be a gift to go deeper in a lot of ways, although most people won't ever see that at the time. That'll come a lot later, but. Yeah, sometimes <laughs> it's difficult because when you're in the middle of suffering, it's hard to question, well, what's what am I supposed to learn from this? You know, but that's what it is. Human life is like a classroom and the suffering is like a class to motivate you or kick you in your butt, so to speak, to begin to question, OK, what's what is obviously I'm not fitting into this world as much as I'd like to or much as I thought I would. Where am I supposed to go? Where am I supposed to fit in? And uh, so, because if nobody ever suffered, why would any anybody question their existence? Why would anybody question, well, how did I get this body? or whatever the case may be. It, 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 so it's it's a, it's supposed to give you that motivation to question your existence and why am I suffering? And like I said, according to the Vedic literature, until you ask those basic questions, you haven't even come up to being a human being yet. Mm -hmm. So this is what the purpose of uh, this whole process of life is all about, is to get you to come up to the level of being discontent being discontent to the point where you can reach a spiritual dimension where you can become content and happy with what your situation is, knowing full well that just studying this literature, studying this culture, and participating in the process of Vedic wisdom, you begin to reach a stage of being balanced, being content, being happy with it, knowing that you're also making your way out of here hopefully once and for all. And, and I don't mean to say that material life is a real drag all the way around, because there's plenty of reasons to be happy with it. You know, there's plenty of good people that we want to interact with. There's plenty of nice things that take place. But at the same time, it doesn't fully satisfy us on the deepest level. Because what really satisfies us in any degree is whatever aspect of spiritual existence we can approach and we can develop. What do we appreciate about each other is our loving and uh, contributory aspect. And that comes from the motivation of the spirit soul. The soul itself exists with that attitude of being loving, wanting to be loved, and wanting to help others. That's the nature of the soul. So the more we come to that nature, the more we become happy with what we are, with what our position is, and with our interactions with others. Without that, you know, you know who who needs uh, who needs material life at all if if it's just filled with suffering without learning from it. Mm -hmm. So that's really yeah, the sure. point of it, at least from that aspect. I mean, there's many more things that could be said, but we'll let it go at that. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I'm I'm sure. Yeah, we could probably talk all day just on that one subject, or probably for a week or <laughs> longer. Um, yeah, for, so for the next question, I've always gone really deep on this question as a physician and throughout the years too, and I'm interested to hear your viewpoint on it. Um, like how do you view illness in the body from a spiritual perspective? I think this is a really powerful question on like, what is the body and, and, and what is, what does illness really mean in it? Um, yeah, there's two ways of looking at that. First of all, many times illness comes from bad habits, bad diet, the things we put into us, um, maybe a bad uh, atmosphere that we're working in, which creates negativity. Uh, maybe we create a bad attitude. Uh, these things all tend to create negativity within the subtle body or even the physical body where, you know, uh, we might smoke cigarettes or something, knowing full well and having been advised that, you know, smoking cigarettes might not be the best thing for you. Well, I know, and I'm going to give it up, but not right now. You know, or the fact that I can't give it up. I'm just too addicted to it. 
And then gradually we get cancer or something like that. And, oh man, I knew, I knew it was, this was going to happen. I shouldn't have done that. I should have changed my habits or should have changed my way. So these kind of things are illnesses of the body, which can sometimes be cured by changing our habits, changing our diet, maybe adding supplements, exercise, fresh air, things like that. Uh, but sometimes they can uh, first be picked up or noticed within the subtle body. And the Vedic literature explains the subtle body as the mind, intelligence, and false ego. And yeah, it considers the false ego as an element. The false ego is an element which creates forgetfulness of our true identity as a spiritual being. So, and that's part of the process of yoga is to overcome this false ego. But the mind and intelligence is also considered two subtle elements which make up the subtle body which the soul also resides in. When you have bad attitudes, well, one thing is that I remember reading where uh, it was explained cancer was a person's uh, manifestation of the, their desire to get out of this situation, to get out of this body, to get out of the material world. And so sometimes there might be a slight attitude of negativity, which then creates symptoms in the body, which actually assist us, although we may not want it that way, but actually assist us in accommodating the attitude we've developed by getting out of this body altogether. And uh, cancer may be one of those ways of doing that. Cancer also may simply be, you know, bad habits, bad uh, diet, uh, things like that. But bad desires and bad attitude can also cultivate within the subtle body to then manifest in the physical body, which then creates problems that we often have to try to overcome. Now, sometimes we can overcome the, the, um, the symptoms of disease by adjusting our attitude along with our diet, taking proper, proper medication and things like that. With a proper attitude, uh, we may be able to overcome these things, but sometimes even with a proper attitude, we still suffer diseases in the body. Now, the second point of it is that also may cause be caused by karma. Karma is the secondary uh, aspect of the manifestation of diseases. Karma usually means reaction, rea uh, action for uh, which develops into a reaction, like uh, smoking cigarettes. What is the karma of smoking cigarettes? Well, cancer. Okay, there's a reaction to the action, but also karma can be uh, when you associate it with reincarnation, and you can't get a proper understanding of reincarnation without the understanding of the law of karma. Karma may be something from previous lives uh that we carry into this life like the fear of drowning the fear of fire may be caused by something that happened in a previous life that we carry into this life or maybe there's something that we did in a previous life which causes reactions that we have to suffer in this life and it could be you know the loss of a job uh maybe a car accident is a part of our karmic reaction we have to suffer, or a disease. Now, when the disease is because of karma, then it may not be as simple as taking medication or changing a diet to be free of that. Uh, you may have to go deeper. There's some mantras that can change one's karma. There's uh, the practice of spirituality can also change one's karma which also creates a, a freedom from disease or a lessening of the disease. Now in the Brahma Samhita, it's explained that when one engages in spiritual yoga or like bhakti yoga explained specifically, that process itself eats up karmic reactions like fire eats up wood. So in that regard, if we take up the process of spiritual uh, you know, advancement, spiritual cultivation. Whatever we were meant to have, maybe like a broken leg, becomes minimized to maybe a stubbed toe or something like that. Something 
that was extreme becomes reduced to something minor. And it also can act that way as far as disease goes as well. If the karma is too strong, then of course it's gonna take a lot of work spiritually and a lot of chanting uh, of mantras and stuff uh, to have much of an effect. And uh, I have to admit one thing, if I have karma to work out, I'd rather work it out in this life than to carry it with me into another life where I have to work it out all over again in another existence. That's just my preference. <laughs> you, nobody else has to follow that, but that's what I would prefer to do. And so if I'm suffering in this life, or if I have to die a particular way in this life because of my karma, I'd rather work it out knowing full well that whatever I'm doing is because of some previous action that I'm suffering from that I don't have to carry with me in any uh, new existence or next existence in a, another lifetime. So there's different ways of looking at that, but that's uh, in essence, that's basically how some disease is explained within the body as manifesting from bad habits, uh, subtle attitudes, <clears throat> or from previous karma. I th I think depend that's depending on that, it will depend on how you want to work at trying to resolve uh, the disease that you're suffering from. Yeah, and I, I think maybe of some of other people's battles too is identifying the origin of it too, or figuring out where it could come from. And yeah, some people from. use uh, hypnosis. Uh, as mm -hmm. one of those uh, means of understanding where their problems, where their disease, or maybe sometimes to where their fears have come from. And some people have used that and have been rather successful as well. So there's different processes that can help in that regard. Yeah, and I, I think the next question is going to tie in really well, because from your book, Prayers, Mantras, and Goetra, Goetras, Goetras. Goetras. <laughs> <laughs> um, could you share a prayer or a mantra that could be powerful from those healing with illness? So people who are listening today that are suffering from an illness or a condition and they want to go down this route or they're trying to figure out how it all ties in in their life, um, what's something you would share with them? Yeah, I can give you a few mantras, actually. <clears throat> I mean, of course, my book, Prayers, Mantras, and Gayatri, has got six, what is it? something like 650 pages of mantras, prayers, and Gayatri's that can be used for so many different purposes. But <clears throat> the famous Sri Gayatri mantra is very well known. And this, the translation of this is Sri Gayatri is very important and well-known Gayatri mantra because it's chanted silently in the mind. Of course, I'm gonna give it to you verbally, but it's chanted three times a day, morning, even uh, at noon and then in the evening. And the translation is, oh, let us meditate on that worshipable effulgence of the divine sun, Savitri, creator of the earth, heaven, and ether, and who enthusiasts, who, uh, who enthuses, enthuses our, in, our meditation. So enthusing our meditation also means uplifting our subtle body and our subtle mind in that regard. And we all worship the sun because the sun, without the sun, there wouldn't be anything, let's face it. But the sun also nourishes the body. In fact, I've heard it said from uh, the process of Ayurveda that morning sun can give, you know, if you expose yourself to the morning sun, you can get all the vitamins you need uh, for nourishment from that process. I don't limit myself to that specifically, but it's one of the things that I've heard that said. But the famous Gayatri mantra goes, Om Bur Bhuvahasva Tatsavachar Varenyam Bargo Devasya Dimahi Diyoyo Na Pachodayat. So that's, uh, that's the main Gayatri mantra that many people throughout India and throughout the world chant when they say that. Now there's another mantra that uh, is called the Maha Mrichunjaya Mantra to Lord Shiva. And this is for removing ailments, ill health, and fear. Now the translation is, we worship the three-eyed one, which is Lord Shiva, who is fragrant 
and who nourishes well all beings and grants liberation just as the cucumber is severed from bondage to the creeper. In other words, if you want to use the cucumber for recipes, nourishment, or whatever, you got to chop it away from the creeper. So in the same way, we this mantra helps grant liberation from fear and illness, just as the cucumber is chopped away from the creeper, the vine, to become useful. So this mantra goes, Om Shrayambakam Yajmaha Sagundam Pushti Vardhanam Uvarukam Ivam Bandhanat Michor Mukshiya Mamritat. So this is, uh, and I've had the, uh, I knew a person who had cancer. And he would chant this mantra over and over again for maybe an hour or two every day. And he gives credit to this mantra for his cancer going into remission. So this is a very, also a very interesting mantra. I'll just say it one more time. Om Trayambakam Yajmahe Sugandim Pushti Vardhanam Uvarukam Ivam Bandhanat Mrichor Mrikshya Mamritat. So this is also, uh, and many of the Gayatri mantras are all dedicated to one of the divin Vedic divinities. So this is to Lord Shiva. There's another one here. Now this is, uh, <clears throat> of course, another very well-known mantra. And it simply means, uh, may all be happy, may all be free from disabilities, may all look for the good in others, and may none suffer from sorrows. So this goes, Sarve Bhavantu Sukhina, Sarve Santu Nirmaha, Sarve Bhadrani Pushantu, Ma Kascha Dukkha Bhagavad. So that's also another one that they often chant in, say, different rituals and things like that, to bring about auspiciousness and the good feeling in yourself towards ourselves and towards others. So uh, this is also very helpful. Another one of the main mantras that has to be explained, and that's what I wrote that one book on, Chanting the Power of the Maha Mantra. This is simply, everybody knows this one. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. And one can chant it or sing it or whatever, but I have a friend of mine, and she says that in the morning when she gets up, she may not be feeling that well, she may be lacking energy or whatever, but after chanting this mantra for an hour or so every morning, after that, her whole day changes. After she feels more enthusiasm, more energy, more lightheartedness, and uh, a connection, of course, with the divine, which is the ultimate purpose of that particular Hare Krishna mantra, is to create within us an awakening of our own spirituality, our own spiritual identity, and what is our connection with the divine, the supreme spiritual being. So these are all very important and uh, very useful and very easy mantras to chant. And uh, so um, I highly recommend them. And I use them in my own spiritual practice every morning, my own sadhana. And uh, they definitely help me. They make a big difference in my life. So I'm sure it can do the same for your viewers and, and everybody else who comes in contact with them too. Yeah, thank you for sharing. I can, I can feel them even when you're speaking them at that moment too. Mm -hmm. I think there's real power. So I think that's a lot of great resources for the people who are listening. And um if they want, if if our readers want to start with one of your books, and I know this is probably a hard question <laughs> to answer, mm. if they they want to dig in more and start learning, what would you advise would be the first book uh, for them to start reading um, um, your books? Or? Well, it depends on how deep they want to go. If they want to go in a simplified way, there's one here called Yoga and Meditation, Their Real Purpose and How to Get Started. Uh, of course, the one you mentioned, uh, the soul understanding our real spiritual identity, uh, is another one which is easy to read and not very long. So that's a, a good one to get started with, and you can get deeper into that. Then there's other ones that I've got uh, called uh, one called the Secret Teachings of the Vedas, and uh, of course you can go on my website, 
which is www.steven, S-T-E-P-H-E-N, hyphen, map, K-N-A-P-P, dot com. And you can look over the books that I've got on my front page, just scroll down a little bit, and all 50 books are listed. You can decide which one might be best for you. And I've got another one. Now, this is a deeper book. This is, uh, this is what is this? This is like uh, 400 pages, one of my long books. But this is called Bhakti Yoga, The Easy Path of Devotional Yoga, subtitled From the Depths of Illusion to Making Contact with God, and explains you know, the details of how Bhakti Yoga works and the step-by-step -step process in being able to follow that. But that's another book that's a little deeper. I have another book called The Bhakti Yoga Handbook, which is a little simpler and especially meant for those that want to practice Bhakti Yoga at home. But this one, Bhakti Yoga, uh, will definitely explain all the intricacies and the step-by-step -step process of engaging in Bhakti Yoga, which is one of the easiest forms of yoga in this day and age of Kali Yuga. So that's why I present that. So, but otherwise, I, there's so many different levels of uh, uh, that you can get started on. And any of my books can help you do that. So hopefully that'll help out. Yeah, I, th I think that's a lot of great information. And we'll be sure to put your website on the description. So wherever this video is, people can find it easy and take a look for themselves as well. Oh, okay. See what Thank resonates you. with them. Um, so the last question we have today, which I think is pretty important just because especially in America, what yoga is today and how it's very commercialized and it can be very confusing when you say that word or, or what it really means. Um, so how do you feel about the yoga movement of today? And what do you think the real purpose is of yoga? Well, uh, in a way, I think any, any, uh, progress in yoga is a good thing and any, uh, form of um, advocating yoga is also a good thing. Um, and it can, it, in some ways, it can be used as a secular means of simply developing the body and, and the mind in uh, doing the exercises and things like that. But uh, it's a step-by-step -step process. Uh, the yoga that we see today is primarily hatha yoga. Hatha yoga is basically the first step in yoga in preparing the body for what is actually meant to be long periods of deep meditation so that the energy flows nicely through the body so that you can sit for long periods of time if necessary to meditate and meditation itself is as it's described in some places where it's a matter of extending the gap between one thought and another because in that gap of vacancy of the mind, one becomes able to get a glimpse of your true spiritual identity without always the internal conversation, always uh, disrupting your focus on who and what you really are, because the mind is like that. The mind is, mind is considered the center of the senses. So you've got all these senses coming at you, whether it's feeling, hearing, seeing, smelling, touching, all these different things are constantly coming at you and the mind is always interpreting it. Oh, this is agreeable. Oh, that's not so agreeable. And then the intelligence kicks in and said, well, how can I get more of what is agreeable and avoid uh, more of what is not agreeable? So this is how the mind is always acting. So you want to quiet the mind and yoga and breathing exercises, pranayama, is a means of assisting yourself to quiet the mind and be able to be less disturbed by the externals so that you can go more inward and then gradually understand what you really are as a spiritual being and what is your connection with the Supreme Spirit, the super soul within you, or Bhagavan, the external uh, aspect of God himself, uh, in your and what is your relationship with God in this regard. And then how to act on that relationship. So yoga is meant to bring yourself up to a level where you can begin to focus on that and meditate on it. And then eventually, even if you're able to, which is very hard to do in this day and age, reach a state of samadhi. Samadhi means a constant flow of continual thought 
on the supreme object of meditation, which of course is the supreme spirit or God. And the more you meditate on God, the more you reach God, the more you can reach God in your next existence. The Bhagavad Gita explains that that which occupies the consciousness of a person at the time of death is where he takes up his next life. So the whole point of meditation is to reach the point of samadhi where you're constantly thinking of your ultimate goal, which is how to reach God, how to enter into the spiritual dimension where you no longer come back to this material world. You become spiritualized enough where you no longer are interested in the material world anymore. You're no longer interested in satisfying the mind and senses. You're only interested in acquiring that which satisfies the soul. And as you reach that more and more and deeper and deeper, then that's the level of consciousness you develop so that as you give up the body, you attain a particular level of consciousness and focus, samadhi, so that you are simply focused on the ultimate goal of life, which is to reach God in the spiritual dimension. That's really what uh, yoga is meant for. And we have different types of yoga that all help you do that. We have bhakti yoga, which is a level, the yoga of love and devotion towards the Supreme Being. We have karma yoga, uh, yoga of action, jnana yoga, the yoga of uh, knowledge and meditation. And we have raja yoga or astanga yoga, which is the ultimate goal of uh, meditation, the meditative process, uh, simply sitting and avoiding the senses, the sensory uh, dictation that we always have, and being able to avoid that. Whereas Raja Yoga is based on emptying the mind of the sensory activities so that you can focus on the Supreme. Bhakti Yoga, or even Mantra Yoga, is a process where we don't empty the mind, but we fill the mind with transcendental knowledge transcendental activity, uh, mental uh, activity in focusing on the pastimes of Krishna, the loving aspect of Krishna, the personality of Krishna, uh, these kind of things. And we fill the mind with the transcendental sound vibration of the Hare Krishna mantra or other mantras so that uh, we can absorb ourselves in that, So, which is much easier. It's much easier to fill the mind with transcendence than it is to empty the mind to hopefully perceive transcendence. So this is the goal. Mm -hmm. uh, and the point of this process in this day and age in Kali Yuga is to fill the mind with that, which is our ultimate object of meditation, rather than trying to relieve our mind of any sensory activity so that we can focus on the ultimate object of meditation. Just meditate on it. Just chant Hare Krishna. Krishna is in his name. So just chant Hare Krishna. Just um, meditate on the Puranas, especially the Bhagavad Purana, which describes Krishna's pastimes and his uh, activities and his different avatars, so that you're automatically focused on him without any, mm, what should I say, unnecessary um, austerity or difficulty or tapasya or uh, practice, and just get to the point of it. Focus on Krishna, focus on the Supreme Being, everything is solved. Simple as that. So <laughs> that may sound easier than it is, but uh, that's how you get started. And that's uh, pr practically, as I've said, in this Kali Yuga, it is the recommended process for this age. Yeah, and it's it seems as though everything is a building block. So starting at whatever stage in yoga and going to reach that point of clearing the mind and and that's a beautiful that thing about the Vedic process. Whatever level you want to investigate, it's all open. There's nothing mm -hmm. that is said to be um, uh, contradictory. There's nothing said to be uh, unapproachable. Uh, you follow whatever process that works for you. Because, you know, we're not dealing with just one lifetime. I mean, I know some of the monotheistic religions believe in you got just one lifetime and you're going to heaven or hell. But in the Vedic culture, that's not the... That's not the system. The system is we've already been through many lifetimes. We can take as many lifetimes as we need to investigate whatever part of the process of spiritualizing our lives that we want. It's recommended, of course, 
that if you want to speed things up, there's certain things that you can do and certain processes to follow, but it's completely up to you. So you're not restricted in that sense, as in, say, some other religions that might uh, impose that on you. So that's one of the things I also like about the Vedic culture. <laughs> yeah, and it seems that as much as you want to question it, it has answers and, and you can kind of start anywhere you want and you can find the information. Right, right. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for coming today and sharing all of your knowledge. I feel like we could pretty much talk about each one of those subjects all day long <laughs> and maybe we'll yeah. have you again to go a little deeper just on one of those subjects. But thank you sure. for your time today. And it was super amazing to get all of your wisdom and knowledge on Vedic culture. Okay. Well, thank you very much for having me and namaste and Jai Shri Krishna. <laughs> thank you very much.